Bem-vindos ao mini curso número 4 do nosso programa temático, organizado pelo professor Samuel Siltanen. São três aulas ao todo, hoje, na quinta e na sexta-feira. E o curso trata de tomografia por raio-x, suas tecnologias e modelos matemáticos. Bom, bom curso a todos. Samuel, por favor, please. Thank you very much. Obrigado. And I would like to start by thanking Professor Antonio Leita for the kind invitation to come to speak at IMPA. And I would like to thank IMPA and all the other organizers of this event. It's a great honor and pleasure to speak at this distinguished institute. So my topic this time is uh, the mathematics of sparse data X-ray tomography, uh, which Uh, differs from traditional X-ray tomography in that there is very little data and the inverse problem of recovering the internal uh, properties of the target becomes very difficult. But difficulty is the core of inverse problems, of course. So, uh, also I re represent the Finnish uh, Center of Excellence in inverse problems research that has been going on now for uh, 12 years and actually Uh, next year starts a new period uh, with the name Center of Excellence in Inverse Modeling and Imaging. As you can see, we try to cover the whole map of Finland with inverse problems research groups. And this is how well we are doing right now. M maybe there are more in the future. Also, let me comment a little bit uh, about my background, which is maybe a bit unusual for a university professor. Uh, I started after my PhD thesis, uh, I started work at Instrumentarium Imaging, uh, a Finnish medical imaging technology company that was founded in the year uh, 1900. Uh, there I worked with the development of medical uh, x-ray devices for mammography, dental imaging, and surgical imaging. After a couple of years, I did an academic postdoc in Japan and returned uh, to the company, but meanwhile GE Healthcare had bought the company. So I returned to an American uh, corporate culture, and soon thereafter, actually, GE decided to sell the dental imaging part, and my team and I went to this new company, Palodex Group, and developed a product I will also describe uh, in this course later, which is based on sparse data x-ray tomography. Uh, after that one, uh, I returned to the academic life first in, in Tampere, and now I have been working at University of Helsinki uh, for, for eight years. Also, let me introduce my team. We have Markus Juvonen and Alexander Mini here to help. At some point in the course, we'll have some MATLAB uh, works, which, on the other hand, I will live code here in the front. And if any of you uh, is interested in working with the MATLAB assignments, have your laptop with you with MATLAB, and Marcus and Alexander will help you with that. Not today yet, but on, on, on Friday, we'll have a session with MATLAB coding. So let me start uh, by giving a little idea what kind of things are going on in my, in my lab. So this is one of the experiments we did. Uh, here is uh, Andreas, my previous student, uh, Tatiana, my postdoc, and Juho Rimpelainen, who works on his master's thesis, and the X-ray lab built by Alexander Mini. So, Tatiana took this piece of lotus root, an oriental food stock. Then we uh, took different chemical elements. We looked at the periodic table of elements, and we filled these holes of the lotus root with some different elements to have different X-ray attenuation coefficients involved. As you see, applied math is a lot of fun to play around. This is uh, our X-ray camera, Hamamatsu camera. We put this on a rotating stage and start to rotate the object. Uh, then here is the X-ray source. We put the X-rays on. And then we see through the whole thing, which is the whole idea of X-ray imaging. We take one slice here and consider a two-dimensional tomography problem. This is the so-called sinogram, which I will explain in the course. And here you can see the classical filtered back projection reconstruction 
of the inside of the object. So this is the kind of stuff we are dealing in this course. So my course is, is divided into these parts. Probably I won't be able to go through all of this today. So some of this will be uh, on Thursday's lecture. But I've organized it in the way that first I would like to tell you a little bit uh, about the applications of X-ray tomography. Where is it needed and where is it used? Then we'll go to the mathematics. We'll see how to model X-ray attenuation. Uh, and what is special when we do tomography with sparse data or or very uh, not, not complete data sets. I talk about regularization, overlapping there with, with Professor Hoffman's course, but I think from a different viewpoint. My Banach spaces are just Rn, so Bernd is working with a much more uh, general situation. Also, I want to say something about the back projection operator we see there, and also mention about filtered back projection, which is kind of the basic workhorse of practical X-ray devices. Then we'll go on first a real-world example with a walnut, and then something more realistic, actually working with, with some people in a hospital. And then this may be already Thursday's material, but limited angle tomography and how that is, can be used in, in practical uh, dental X-ray imaging in actual new, new kind of a product. So that's kind of the outline. After this one, if we have time, and depending on your interest, we could look at, for example, regularization parameter choice methods or what is needed to make these computations really practical in the large scale of realistic problems. So there are a couple of options at that point. All right. So, X-rays, let's start from the beginning. Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen received the first ever Nobel Prize for the invention of x-rays. Here is one of the, one of the early x-ray images uh, of, of uh, Röntgen's wife's hand. She commented, now I have seen my death. Uh, as kind of a maybe pessimistic view, I think what x-ray imaging became to be, it's much more for life uh, because it's in the hand of doctors. These uh, uh, researchers, Hounsfield and, and Cormac, did great uh, progress in, in, in tomographic imaging. They invented it. And this is one of the original old pictures taken by, by Hounsfield. Actually, at that point, they thought that it seems that between the skull and the brain, there is some kind of empty space here because of this black area here. Uh, this was kind of in contrast with autopsy information. And actually, it turns out to be wrong. There is no air gap like that, it's because of beam hardening, because of the X-ray tubes have different energies in their photons. It was later found and understood and corrected for, but in the old pictures, it's still there. So this was another Nobel Prize in the field of X-ray tomography. Also, I must mention Johann Radon, the Austrian mathematician who published this famous formula already in 1917. Uh, explaining how to recover a function of two variables from the knowledge of line integrals of that function along any line in the plane. It was a big theoretical breakthrough, but still it took more than 50 years for such thinking to go into, into medical imaging practice. And I think, uh, I think it's a duty of a modern applied mathematician to try to bring mathematical insights like this a bit quicker to the service of mankind in the form of applications. So here are a couple of examples how tomographic X-ray imaging is used. So I think uh, in the United States alone, annually, some 70 million uh, CT scans are taken. So it's really an everyday tool for doctors. Here, uh, these dark parts in the liver are actually cancer. In this image, uh, we see how we can distinguish between two kinds of stroke. You know, when there's a problem with the blood circulation in the brain, called a stroke, the symptoms are asymmetric uh, smile, also difficulties in speaking, and when trying to lift up hands, one, one of the hands stays down. 
meaning that if this hand is down, then there's some problem on this side of the brain. It would be good to start the right treatment right away. I mean, if it's bleeding, like uh, in this case, this is blood, uh, they should give a medication that will coagulate blood. On the other hand, if it's an ischemic stroke, like here, where blood clot is preventing blood from entering this black area, they should give blood thinning medication. But if you give the wrong one, it's very dangerous. So the way to know which one it is, well, can be done with, with tomographic imaging. Here we see very clearly white is the color of blood in CT, and the ischemic stroke is, is like a black area like this. Also, for bone fractures, I think this is one of the oldest use of x-rays, uh, but also with 3D reconstructions, it's possible to do very detailed three-dimensional renderings of the, of the uh, fracture. So it's really an everyday tool for doctors, uh, but actually this, these examples are not with sparse data x-ray tomography. These are with kind of full and very complete data tomography. Let's go a little bit now more to the mathematical modeling behind this kind of imaging. So first of all, we need to take a look what happens to x-rays when they travel inside some material. Here you see an x-ray traveling tr through a block of homogeneous material. And we see the intensity of the x-ray in the beginning is, is I0. So in the empty space, there is no change in, oh, sorry. Uh, where is it? No change in intensity. Oh, come on. Oh. having trouble with this controller. Okay, so this is where we're. So first, no change in intensity. Then inside the material, there's an exponential decay in intensity. And then finally, in the end, we have this lower intensity I1 than the original I0. The law that describes what's happening here is so-called bear lambert law, which in this very simple case, when we have homogeneous material, takes this form. So I0 and I1 are connected with this quite simple formula, having the exponential function, a minus sign here. Mu is a positive number describing how strongly does this material attenuate x-rays. And S is the width uh, or the length of the path that the x-ray travels inside this material with coefficient mu. With two blocks, something like this would happen that it attenuates first, then stays constant a little while, and then another exponential attenuation happens. But then, let's see how to go from these intensity measurements into line integrals like I mentioned about Radon's result that he considered the knowledge of line integrals of a non-negative function. So in this kind of very simple case, what we can do, let's send uh, 1,000 photons from here. So that's the I0, the initial intensity. And we have a detector here that measures those 1,000 photons. Then when the X-ray travels through this block, which I chose to be of exactly half thickness for this x-radiation, we see that out of the 1,000 photons, only 500 go through, and that's what we measure. And in this case, we have 500 left here, and then another half will get absorbed or scattered, so we have 250. So this is what our detector gives us, apart from random noise, which I'm ignoring here. Uh, if we take a logarithm to counteract the bear lambert law, we get these numbers. And now, actually, the line integral here should be zero, because there is nothing in the way of the x-ray. So actually, we should subtract these numbers from 6.9. So we get here zero. We get here 0 0.7 in some 
mysterious units, but if we don't care about the units right now, we can still observe that here we have double that amount. So nothing, some, some uh, material in the way, and here double that amount. So with these simple calibration steps, we actually have the line integral information. So the bear lambert law in, in its more complicated form looks like this. So the final intensity when exiting the material is the initial intensity times the exponential of, with a minus sign, the integral of the non-negative attenuation function along the path of the X-ray through the material. After a little computation, we can see actually it's written in this kind of form where on the left-hand side, is something we know from measurements. Namely, this one we know by calibration of our equipment or taking a picture with nothing in the way of the x-rays, then we know I zero. And this one we measure along the ray that went through the material. So on the left side in the equation, we have something coming from the measurements. And here we have a line integral. So that's uh, the mathematical model of a single x-ray going through some material. So we can think of something like this, that uh, our calibrated information is collecting together cumulatively how much stuff is the X-ray experiencing on its way through the material. And we can find this number in the end by, by the calibration I showed. Then let me describe the way that Hounsfeld used to build his first CT machine. So he actually had this kind of linear movement uh, of the X-ray source, collecting such a profile through the target or a two-dimensional slice of the target. And then he made the whole machine turn. So actually for each angle you see here, uh, he had to do the linear movement. So it was a quite slow uh, method of measurement. The modern scanners are much faster actually. But this is the way how Hounsfield did it. And this one here, you see, this is the so-called sinogram where these profiles are put uh, as the function of the turning angle. So that's kind of the data uh, we have. Just to mention that modern CT scanners are actually really fast machines. They look like this, as you most probably know from TV shows, if not, if not uh, otherwise. So it's a donut shaped thing where the patient goes in like this and it's just the patient is linearly moved in and what happens inside this donut looks like this. So you see it's actually quite powerful stuff that's going on. It's really fast rotation. You will see how this bed sheet starts to move in the wind caused by, caused by this rotation. So it's actually quite a impressive, the modern CT technology, much faster than Hounsfield's. I think these are generation four scanners, these kind of fast ones. And then we can take a look how uh, Johan Radon's formula looks like. So it builds up uh, the, the uh, unknown object from the sinogram. In a way, I will briefly describe later, although this kind of full angle tomography is not really the topic of this course, uh, I'm more interested in, in sparse data or few data imaging. For a couple of reasons, one of the reasons is maybe we want to reduce the radiation dose to the patient, because as you know, X-ray exposure is harmful for people, it causes cancer. So a, a full CT scan is actually okay only if the patient is really sick. If there's cancer or some other really serious thing, then it's ethically okay to give the big radiation dose. Sometimes it's not so okay, and then it's nice to have a, a lower dose imaging. And sometimes we just, for geometric restriction reasons, we cannot go all around the object or the patient. So then also we have a limited data set. So let's see how to build up mathematics for that kind of case. So let me uh, immediately emphasize that I'm not thinking about Radon transforms and integrations over angular variables. I am speaking about really uh, 
basic numerical modeling of the situation, dividing the target into pixels or voxels in the 3D case. So in this case, uh, in a very simple example, I'm showing a square patient with nine internal organs that are also square shaped. And in, inside each organ, we have x-ray attenuation. And now for this very simple model, uh, I introduce uh, x-ray imaging. So actually, if we agree that the length of one of these little squares is one, we can think that after calibration, what we have is actually the row sum of these numbers here. And now we can think that, okay, we take a horizontal x-ray, we get these row sums of this uh, matrix of attenuation values, then we rotate, we get column sums, and in this particular uh, simple example, I also do diagonal measurements and there, of course, we have to remember the great Pythagoras and add there the length of the diagonal of the square because this is the length of the path the x-ray is going through that specific pixel. Okay, so this is the direct problem in this simple case. If we know the numbers inside those nine squares, of course, we can very easily compute those numbers uh, outside. This is the real thing. This is the inverse problem. We are given those numbers outside and we are facing this kind of Sudoku-like problem. Fill in the numbers that match the sums. And this is actually at the core of tomography. This is the tomographic problem. Of course, in practice, there are plenty of pixels or voxels, millions of them, maybe hundreds of millions. But at the core, this is how in this course we think about tomography. And then as the first step into really uh, sparse data tomography, let's still forget a few of these x-rays we had uh, in this picture and let's consider this kind of extremely limited angle and sparse measurement, only six measurements. In that case, uh, let, let us model this, this uh, inverse problem. So this is a linear inverse problem. We can model it uh, with linear algebra and matrices. So what we do is we give names to these unknown values inside pixels from F1 to F9 in this case. So the unknown is a vector in R9, in the Banach space R9. <laughs> and uh, our measurement consists of six numbers only. So we have, we have our measurement in the Banach space R6. And uh, our measurement can be modeled by a matrix A. And also I add here this epsilon that denotes random noise that we always have in practical cases. So what is this matrix A? In this case, we simply build it up from the lengths of paths inside the pixels. So for example, uh, if we look at the measurement number one, so what is the first row in the A matrix it comes from here, so this is measurement one. We see that the x-ray goes a square root of two length inside pixel number two and square root of two length inside the pixel number six. That's why we have here square root of two in position two and six. So as you see, it's quite a simple bookkeeping matter to build up this measurement matrix for tomography. So then, Let's look at this very simple example. Already this one <coughs> shows us some of the uh, problems we will face in, in realistic tomography problems. So first of all, uh, this matrix has some kernel, so we have non-uniqueness in the inverse problem. Here I'm showing you three different patients that actually produce exactly the same data from these directions we are using. So if you, if you compute those directions, you see that these three things give exactly the same data. Uh, then we could think how to solve this problem, how to, how to invert, how to solve the inverse problem. We have a matrix which is six times nine. So it's not even a square matrix. We can't invert it, but we could try a least square solution. You know, least square, so uh, we have an equation, matrix equation AF equals M, 
and we want to find an F tilde, first of all, that has, if you look at the measurement error, if we put F tilde vector inside our grid of three by three pixels and make the measurements with the matrix A, and we compare the measurements to the M measurement we have. So this is the measurement error for our F tilde vector. So a least square solution must have the same square norm error than the minimal possible square error, first of all. Then among all of the minimal norm so solutions, we pick out the shortest one. That's called the minimum norm solution. That has to be uh, the shortest one of all least square solutions. And practically, if you want to compute this guy, uh, this, this is the formula to compute it. Okay, but even for our simple case, we get the wrong answer if we apply uh, the least squares, the minimum norm solution. Well, of course, we can see here that maybe this is not so good. There's a negative pixel, meaning that inside this pixel, the X-ray is getting stronger. This is physically impossible, so we should have a non-negativity constraint. Well, we can use a non-negative minimum norm solution, and we get this one, which is non-negative okay, but it's still wrong. It's not, not the original one. So even with this very simple case, we see that it's, it's not so easy to find uh, the object. And next, let's do a bit more complicated example. So first I define this kind of uh, CT phantom, which is now a function in L2 of R2. So we have a constant value in this gray area. Outside this is zero. This we have some constant value, and I think, yeah, so I put here 0 0.44, here 0 0.16, and here zero. So this kind of digital uh, phantom or vector graphics phantom, which we have to discretize next. Namely, uh, when we, in tomography, when we measure some object, in 2D tomography, we have some object in this square here, and in this schematic picture, we have a total of five directions of measurement. And then when we do a numerical solution for the inverse problem, we have to represent the unknown in some finite way for us to attack the problem with a computer. So we discretize the area where we know that the unknown is, but how many pixels? There is no general rule how many pixels should we use. We can choose the number of pixels as we wish. So we have a freedom there to choose how many pixels we want. Uh, at this point, at this point, I often hear the comment, why would you ever use a smaller pixel in the spatial domain than the pixel uh, in your detector? That's a good point, I think. On the other hand, if we think about, for example, the finite element method, where computationally you want to approximate a solution of an elliptic partial differential equation, where typically you have a continuum theory, and the solution is, let's say, in H1 of, of, of a space domain, and then you do a triangulation of the domain and work in the finite dimensional subspace spanned by piecewise linear functions defined uh, on the triangles, for example. And then, of course, in finite element theory, you prove theorems saying that when your triangle size goes smaller and smaller, you approximate a finite element solution converges to the actual continuum solution of the problem. I think in inverse problems, we would need a similar theory of refining uh, the resolution of the reconstruction. Of course, there, there are some analyses to that direction, but I would say uh, there is still more work to be done in that kind of analysis of convergence of, of reconstructions in inverse problems. So from that kind of point of view, I think it's good to keep it open, this kind of possibility of taking even quite fine uh, discretizations of the unknown. Okay, but anyway, I promised to do an example. So uh, what I showed here, this is kind of a function, a continuum example. This is a function defined on every point of R2. We have to discretize it. So let me choose uh, a pixel grid of 32 by 32. And now, in that pixel size, uh, we need to build the tomographic matrix. So I choose 
15 directions of projection in the parallel beam geometry. So this is the first one. And here you see some of the elements already in the measurement matrix A. Uh, the size will be this 1024 columns comes from the fact that our unknown is 32 by 32 pixels. That's 1024 pixels. And then uh, we have this number of angles coming from MATLAB's internal workings, the exact number here. So I'm, I'm turning uh, this angle and in that process collecting more and more non-zeros inside the matrix. So anything white inside here is a zero element and there are lots of blue dots showing where we have these lengths of x-rays inside those pixels. So in this case, there are already quite a lot of them. It's a big, well, bigish matrix uh, of, of, of this size. And now let's see, uh, do we still have some problems like we saw this non-uniqueness and weird things of not getting the right answer with minimum norm solutions, not even with non-negative ones? So if I simulate data from this, uh, the object discretized in this 32 by 32 size, uh, our sinogram looks like this. And at this point, I would like to bring up this nice theorem from Smith, Solomon, and Wagner paper from 77, which is a mathematical theorem saying that a finite number of radiographs gives you nothing. And what do they prove there? Uh, the thing is that they are looking at the situation in, in R2, not, not pixelized in any way, just in R2. There's a compactly supported uh, function that we are measuring. We know the line integrals uh, along a finite number of directions. But in each of those directions, we know all line integrals. So it's really a continuum. Uh, I mean, really an infinite amount of data, but the directions, number of directions of projection is finite. So then in the proof, they constructed a function, really constructed uh, step by step a function that gives a zero measurement in this, in this situation. And then arguing that, okay, if you want to recover some function from such a finite direction data, uh, you can't do it because then you don't know what you get. Uh, it, it can be, the actual thing can be a sum of something and then the ghost image they showed that gives a zero measurement. So it's quite a mathematical argument. And in practice, it doesn't cause so many problems. Actually, in practice, we can recover a lot of stuff from finite data. The reason, there are, I think, two reasons for it. One is that when we pixelize the image, it already restricts what kind of things we can see because these functions they constructed are highly oscillatory. And if we are working in a pixel-based uh, base of functions, there cannot be so fine oscillations because there are only so many pixels. And the other reason is, of course, that we regularize. When we solve an inverse problem, we need to regularize. And that will take care of the rest of the problems, actually, mostly. Anyway, so now if I apply uh, the minimum norm solution method to our sinogram, this is what we get. Uh, in this picture, the pixel values are of the order of 10 to the power 14. So this is absurdly wrong. I mean, this is so complete garbage as, as a numerical solution can be. R really, really bad result. Also, we can, we can uh, use the non-negative minimum norm solution. That's not as badly wrong, but it's still wrong, and it doesn't really look anything like the real thing. So still, we see there is something going on. I mean, we are dealing with a matrix equation that's, that's not approachable, really, with, with the classical least squares uh, approach. It's about ill-posedness, of course. This is an ill-posed inverse problem, and let me demonstrate the ill-posedness in this specific discretization. Namely, this object here and this object here give almost the same sinogram when we apply the matrix A. So the difference between these two objects is quite large, as you can see. But the difference between their data, their, their sinograms, is less than 1%. And there are more. Here's another one. Also, these two guys are very close 
to each other in, on the measurement space. So this is ill-posedness. Big differences in the objects get mapped into small differences in the data. And actually, the things uh, I'm overlaying here to the actual thing are digital versions of those ghosts from that theorem, I would say. That's an oscillatory functions that give, give a close to zero measurement. So I can add them here without affecting the data so much. And now the reason, so what's happening here can be clearly seen using the singular value decomposition. For any matrix, we can, we can uh, define this singular value decomposition where U and V matrices uh, are orthonormal matrices so their transpose is their uh, inverse matrix. In between there is D, which is a diagonal matrix like this, containing non-negative singular values along the diagonal and ordered so that the largest one is first and then they go down towards zero, so there is an ordering like this. And there may be a bunch of zeros here and I'm denoting by DR the last one that's really strictly positive. And from the dr index on, they are all zero. Of course, it's possible that they are all zero for the zero matrix. And of course, it's possible that dr is actually the last one so that they are all strictly positive. But this is, this is the source of the problems we saw with the minimum norm solution. Because the condition number, the relationship, the, the ratio between the largest and smallest singular value is really large. Uh, here we see the singular values for the tomographic matrix we just constructed. So you see that um, the singular values, and note this is a logarithmic scale. So they start out by being roughly in the order of like one, and then they start to gradually go small. And there is no clear point where they would really drop to exactly zero, which would be like a rank deficient matrix. This is not rank deficient the singular values just go small and they really go very small. They're, they're extremely in a different order of magnitude than the first ones in the end here. This is why we had these bad results in the reconstruction. Let me show you another example with three squares like this. Uh, also showing nicely why this thing is called the sinogram. If there are almost point-like objects like this, they are drawing sinusoidal curves into the data matrix. So for this one as well, we can find other objects that have almost the same data. This one and another one and yet another one that have very closely, this, this has even extremely closely almost the same data. And here also, if we invert, we will not get a good result with these ones. Okay, so, so far, what I hope to have achieved is to show you how to mathematically model an X-ray tomographic situation with a linear matrix model. And also I showed that the traditional least squares techniques just fail uh, with these approaches. And that's because of the ill-posedness. So then of course we need regularization. So let's take a look at a few regularization methods and how they look like for, for this problem. So now, of course, um, we are dealing with Adamard's definition of well-posed and ill-posed problems. Um, Adamard required that there has to be a solution to the problem, and there has to be actually only one solution, and the output should depend continuously on the input. In the case of inverse problems, this means, that, I mean, the input is actually M, the measured data, and the output should be F, which is the unknown target. And actually, in a typical inverse problem, including the ones I'm, I'm talking about here, usually all of these three fail. But even if one of them fails, it's, uh, it's an ill-posed inverse problem. But I think maybe the most, most troublesome of these is, is the third one, which is shown by this gradual decay of the singular values. Now for the matrix case, because we are dealing with linear inverse problems here, we actually have a quite informative view how these Adamard's conditions look like for matrices. 
because for any matrix we can define these subspaces. So this is the kernel of A. These are the dimensions. So in this picture, so this is Rn, and I'm showing here R7, these little intervals here depicting the dimensions. And here R6 uh, in this way. So these three dimensions here are squeezed to zero by the action of A, that's the kernel. Then uh, in the target space, there may be some co-kernel of A. So here are some vectors that are just not in the image of matrix A. So we, we cannot reach this M uh, by multiplying any vector F from here. They will never hit M. And then there is uh, the range of A, which has a bijective correspondence to the orthogonal complement of the kernel. And here, even though this is a bijection, it may be very unstable because of the singular values going, going to zero. So if there's bad condition number, the first singular value much bigger than the last non-zero one, uh, then even in this seemingly nice bijection part, there may be problems with stability. So in Adamard's terms, non-uniqueness uh, uh, refers to the existence of the kernel because then we can have, we can add a member of the kernel to any vector and get the same measurement. The problems with existence in Adamart's sense are related to this guy. If our noisy measurement is outside the range of A, there is no vector here that will be mapped to M. So there is no existence for the inverse problem. And the third one, which is the hardest to define in this kind of finite dimensional case, so strictly speaking, uh, for, for matrix models of inverse problems, there cannot be uh, a problem with Adamard's third condition because we are dealing with the singular values up to this point. So mathematically speaking, there is a bijection. So I think the good way of thinking about it is that Behind a matrix model of an inverse problem, there is a continuum situation, like in this tomography, we have a function really defined on Rn and line integrals. And then if we use finer and finer matrix models for our approximation, uh, the closer we are approximating a compact operator that in the continuum case doesn't have a continuous inverse. And we can see it uh, in the blowing up of the condition number. So even if for any fixed finite dimensional inverse problem, there is strictly speaking a bijection here, but when we do a more and more precise modeling by adding a decrease of freedom, the condition number gets worse and tends to infinity. Okay, well, this is how the minimum norm solution is computed. So here uh, we just take one over dr and here one over d1. So this number will be very large compared to this one. It will blow up the noise and that's why we saw so bad reconstructions with uh, the minimum norm solution. But then, now in this lecture, the first serious regularized inversion method is the most classical one, so-called uh, Tihon of regularization where we actually write down this kind of penalty functional having two parts. The first part here is measuring for a given vector f, it's measuring how well does this f reproduce the measurements we have from our machine. So we take an f, we perform simulated measurements by multiplying by the system matrix A. Uh, we compare the simulated data and the actual data and take the norm of the residual. Now in ill-post inverse problems, there may be really a whole subspace of Fs that give either perfectly this data or at least very closely, as we saw with these couple of sinograms. So this term alone is not enough to find the right solution. So Tihonov's idea was to add here another penalty that penalizes for the length of the vector F. And also there's a parameter alpha that gives a trade-off between or kind of balancing between these two penalty terms. So this one penalizes for F giving the wrong measurements and this penalizes for F being large. And then we can define uh, a regularization strategy parameterized by alpha 
so that we feed in the measurement m and we find the minimizer of this two term penalty function. So that's the Tihon of regularization and actually one way to compute it is to filter the singular values. We can actually write, uh, so here we have where the singular, singular value decomposition for A was uh, U times D times V transpose. So then we have a regularized inverse matrix by taking V and U transpose on these sides and in the middle we have alpha appearing in this filtering formula for the singular values. In the large case, to a large scale problems, realistic real world inverse problems, this is not very useful because we can have, a, our matrix can be really huge, like hundreds of millions of rows and hundreds of millions of columns. Then it's not practical to compute the singular value decomposition. But then we can use, for example, this formula and implement this inverse matrix using, for example, GMRS or conjugate gradients, some kind of iterative method where we only have to have implementations for the action of A and its transpose. But right now we can, we can still work with this one. And here is the Tihonov regularized reconstruction, of course, for some specific uh, alpha, I chose to have a quite nice, quite close to minimal error. And then we can also include non-negativity constraint, which is usually a really good idea in, in uh, tomographic problems. So we can also use a numerical method that also enforces non-negativity. So then we get, so here we get relative error 12% and including the non-negativity we can push the error down a little bit. Um, actually, let me show you at this point a little bit how this works. It's good to have an intuition. What is this uh, regularization parameter doing? Namely, sorry? Maybe not, probably not the same. I think not the same. So let me show you a little, um, little MATLAB package uh, I created for this course. It will be available online so anyone can, can try out these little methods. So what I built is first of all this kind of, um, this kind of little simulated phantom having this kind of like rectangular areas of, of different uh, X-ray attenuation. And in this, in this um, routine, I wrote it with kind of vector graphics so you can choose with what resolution you want it. So this is 50 by 50, but you can choose whatever resolution and then it will compute, compute for you uh, an approximation of that one on a given resolution. Then um, I did this kind of sequence of of uh, sequence of routines. First of all, this one will compute uh, the matrix A, making use of, of MATLAB's internal command called radon.m. So I'm, I'm doing it in a very brute force way. I'm constructing a 50 by 50 phantom first where there is all zeros except one element in the left uh, top corner is one. I take the radon and then the sinogram gives me the first column of matrix A. Then I move this one pixel in the next position in the phantom, otherwise full of zeros and compute with radon again. And I construct A column by column, which is very wasteful, not good for large scale problems, but very nice for this kind of small problems. So uh, I choose 15 angles so the resolution 50 by 50, by 50 I choose 15 angles uh, in the full 360 degree uh, round and now it computed the matrix and it's computing the singular value decomposition. Now it's done and we see here uh, the matrix, the non-zero elements of the matrix 
And here we see the singular values that again go gradually to zero uh, or near zero in logarithmic scale. Then uh, the next thing in this sequence is we want to compute simulate the data uh, because now we don't have an x-ray device here. We just simulate the data, but there one has to be careful to avoid so-called inverse crime. That means that if we use the exactly same matrix A uh, for the simulation of data for our digital phantom, and then we use the same matrix A in our inversion uh, algorithm, sometimes we get unrealistically good reconstructions, uh, which is, well, it's nice because they are good looking reconstructions, but this is not to be trusted because the whole thing fails immediately when there is noise or real world measurements. So that's why it's nice, even in simulated cases, try to somehow introduce some modeling error in the situation. And in this case, how I do it is actually, I will construct our phantom at the twice bigger resolution. I compute the sinogram for that one, and then I downsample the sinogram. So then it's kind of, uh, measured from not quite a continuum object, but, but anyway, a higher resolution object. So what we get here is something like this. So the first one is the sinogram. The left one is the sinogram with inverse crime. Uh, the middle one is now computed from the higher resolution and downsampled. And then uh, on the right, I'm showing the difference between these two. So you see there is substantial difference, but I mean, not so much that everything would break down. So it's kind of a maybe one way of at least reducing the inverse crime significantly. And here you can see also the phantoms at the two resolutions. So the data comes from the right-hand side, but then we will reconstruct on the left-hand side resolution. Okay, and then uh, we, can, we can actually Okay, well, here it seems that I didn't do the Tihonov ready made. That will be actually an exercise. So let's do it later this week so that you have a chance. Those of you who, you who want to do it as an exercise have a chance. But let's look at truncated singular value decomposition, where we only use some of the singular values. Here, only 10 first ones. So we get something like this, which kind of looks bad, but it's, it's very robust against noise. That's the good side. So let me, in, what I'm doing here is, actually, so this is the, this is the uh, pseudo inverse, but in this case, we are not going up to here because we know that that's bad, that that's multiplying the noise. So we only go up to some point along here and put the rest to zero. That's the truncated singular value decomposition. And now we can, instead of using only 10 singular values, we can, for example, use 200. So now you see we are using already a lot, of, lot more of these singular values Oh, come on, come back. Okay, well, let's run it again. And so here you see that, well, it's kind of closer already to the, to the real thing. And we could, we could use of maybe some more to see what happens. So now we have this many singular values. And then already we kind of start to see something noisy. So there's a kind of a trade off, like in all regularization methods between regularizing too little or too much. It's often quite a deep question, how to choose the optimal point, uh, how to regularize just the right amount. Any questions at this point? Yep. Hmm, well this one is a little bit non-convex here. 
Um, I think here, because in the truncated singular value decomposition, it's actually quite a rigid uh, method of reconstructing because you see, if you think of, so we have the matrix V here and whatever is right to matrix V, it's just a vector. I mean, it's this multiplied by U transpose and then multiplying uh, the measurements. So actually it's V times some vector. So actually the reconstruction has the form of being a linear combination of the columns of V. So actually the truncated singular value decomposition and also the Tikhonov regularization because it can be written in this form, they are actually linear combinations of the columns of V. So we could already take a look at how, the, how do columns of V look like because they are the building blocks of the reconstruction. And they actually come only from the matrix. And then the question if, uh, if, if we can reproduce things in the target, if it's non-convex or not, it's kind of we can already, without knowing about the target at all, we can just look at the singular vectors and what they are like, those are the building blocks. And then uh, depending on how they are, then it's kind of a question, how well can we build from them anything non-convex? I don't know if this answers <laughs> your question, but, but in general, uh, I think of course it makes a difference, convex or non-convex. But I think it's also quite a deep question in, in what way. Yes. Yes, it has here. Oh, okay, so, so the question was, first question was if, if um, there is difference, um, if there are more or less problems if the target is non-convex or not. And to that one I said that, well, at least in, in Tihonov and truncated singular value decomposition, uh, the result is written as a linear combination of singular vectors. And then it's kind of a question, how well can anything be approximated by those fixed singular vectors? And maybe that convex ones are more difficult. And I don't know if this is really a satisfactory answer, but that's what it is. And then, well, Yuri asked about uh, the shape of the matrix and it's really more wide, more wide than, than high. So really it's, it's, it's this shape. Okay. So Tihon of regularization looks like that. And the next, next option I would like to talk about is the so-called total variation regularization. It's kind of a, I would say, kind of a classical uh, way to discuss regularization. Maybe start with the truncated singular value decomposition, which is very directly connected to classical Tihon of, which then can be generalized to Tihonov with smoothness penalty or more complicated penalty terms. But right now I'm, I'm not talking about that one, but I'm moving now to sparsity. Well, this is related to compressed sensing and sparsity promoting methods, which are kind of, have been uh, researched a lot in recent 10 or even 20 years. And now what is going on in, in this sparsity? Let me first try to explain in very simple terms what is going on in, in this kind of sparsity-based approaches. So the, often how to make the difference between non-sparsity and sparsity is via the use of two norms and one norms in the regularizers. And why would this make a difference? Let's look at these two uh, unit spheres. So this is the unit sphere uh, corresponding to the usual Euclidean geometry. I mean, this is the uh, length given by the Pythagoras formula. So this is really the L2 sphere. And now if we are thinking of a minimum norm solution or kind of looking at, looking at an full, of oh, ah, oh, sorry. Looking at the full subspace uh, of equally good solutions uh, in terms of the data, and then we think with the regularizer that we want to pick out the smallest in some specific norm. 
So if we use this uh, two norm, so let's say there is a there is a subspace like this, and now if uh, the solution is let's say here, and now if you perturb the subspace a little bit because of noise or something, uh, the best solution will move a little bit along this sphere. In contrast to this uh, L1 norm unit sphere, what happens here is that if we have a uh, again a subspace of solutions and we want to pick out the smallest one in L1 norm. And now let's ignore the measure zero set of, of anomaly cases where our uh, so subspace is directly uh, aligned with one of these sides. So let's take uh, a subspace aligned like this and then the solution is here and it actually lies on a coordinate axis meaning that the value of this horizontal coordinate is zero here. And sparsity means, strictly speaking, out of an infinite vector, only a finite number of elements uh, are non-zero. In the finite dimensional case, it's again more dubious, but I would say that in a vector, most of the uh, elements are zero. There are only a, a few non-zero elements among a plenty of zeros. So that's somehow what happens with, with here when we, when we take the solution. It's on the coordinate line. So in this picture, one of the coordinates is zero. And even if we perturb our subspace a little bit, the solution will still be on the vertical axis. So even if we perturb a little bit, the solution stays sparse. Some of the coordinates will stay zero. This gives a quite strong effect in, in regularized solutions that has been, well, exploited quite a lot in, in, in the last 20 years or so. So one of the ways to use it is the so-called total variation uh, regularization, where we are penalizing with the one norm of the gradient of the unknown. And in this case, uh, because of technical reasons uh, that come apparent after a few slides, I'm actually looking at the so-called anisotropic total variation, where I'm writing the horizontal derivative, well, here with a matrix that takes a horizontally neighboring pixel differences, and here a vertical derivative taking vertically neighboring pixel differences, and then taking the one norm uh, of the result. So again, this is the same than in Tihonov. Again, we have a regularization parameter here, and, and this one, which is, can be written uh, in this way with these uh, horizontal and vertical pixel differences. The first time this was introduced was in uh, Rudin, Osher and Fatemi in 92, where they considered this in the case of uh, noise removal from, from digital images. So the total variation approach in the, in the context of tomography, it started to be studied, uh, it took a while for TV to go from image denoising to tomography. So that these couple of papers based on simulated data in 98 and 2001. And then uh, I'm happy to report that in Finland, in our team con connected with the instrumentarium company, we were the first ones uh, to publish results with, with measured X-ray data and total variation. Well, after that, it has been studied immensely. And now it's, it's just so many papers that it's impossible to track them, but I would say a couple of the really uh, top groups here in this regards are at DTU, Per Hansen Christian's group at DTU, and also in Chicago, the Sidki and Pans group, they, are done, they have done really nice advances in total variation and tomography. Now, of course, I mean, there are a lot of great numerical analysis works recently about how to efficiently compute these total variation regularized solutions and other sparsity solutions. There's a whole industry of beautiful methods based on complex analysis and other approaches. I'm not an expert on that stuff. My, my, my computational approaches, are, I, I would say, are not, not top-notch <laughs> in, in this sense. I mean, looking at these papers and, and maybe even more, more new ones show how to do it really efficiently, memory-wise, computational-wise. The last I heard, uh, the so-called split Bregman was the leading technique 
maybe there's a new one that's even better, but Split Pregman may be kind of the fourth runner. What I'm using here, uh, because anyway it's for demonstration purposes, I'm using something quite, quite simple. Uh, I'm reducing the penalty functional into a very standard quadratic programming case via a nice trick I learned from Teemu Pennanen, who is an optimization uh, expert. So how to do this is, I would like to go from this penalty functional to something that looks like this, because this is something very standard. There is just a quadratic term, linear term, then some inequality constraints and equality constraints. I would like to convert our problem into such a form because then I can just use MATLAB's quad prog and, and all is fine. Uh, although in the process, as you'll see, the price we have to pay for this one is we will optimize not in n-dimensional space, but five n-dimensional space. So that's something we'd lose. But the thing we win is that then we can effectively compute this thing where nastily there is a two norm here and one norm here. So it's kind of, and this is, also, let me point out, this is not differentiable because it contains absolute value functions that are not differentiable at one point. So direct gradient-based methods are not backed up theoretically, although they work very nicely, actually. <laughs> but there is no proof for them. So let me show you how to do this, this trick here. I like it because it's something quite simple. So both of these horizontal and vertical derivative vectors are written uh, as the difference between two non-negative vectors. Let me draw a little picture here. The idea is that if we have some function that has some positive parts, some negative parts, maybe some more positive, a function like this. So in this picture, so this function would be this LHF. So we write it as a sum of the positive part. The positive part follows here, but when the function is negative, it's zero. So this is this uh, U plus H. And then the other guy is zero here, and then it follows this function here, like this. So this is u plus minus, but actually with a minus sign. So this is a very simple decomposition, and why, why would we do it? The thing is that then uh, the one norm of this guy is just this non-negative uh, vector plus this non-negative vector. And the same for this guy, the one norm is just this plus this. So this is kind of the advantage we get. And then we can put uh, the quadratic part, so we take a new variable z, which lives now in 5n dimensional space. We just list all of these four guys in the same vector. Then uh, the measurement, the quadratic part here, it has the q that actually has only, only this guy, otherwise just lots of zeros. And then uh, the inner products, inner products will, will uh, with th these are just big vectors with elements one. So then, uh, so the C here is given just like this. So now uh, there are some equality constraints, namely these guys are equality constraints connecting some of the elements in this uh, vector. And then we have inequality constraints, namely these ones. And actually, we want uh, f to be non-negative as well. So simply, the whole z just needs to be non-negative. And then we can feed it to MATLAB's quad prog and, and go from there. So for this uh, CT phantom, uh, we get such a picture. And nicely, the relative square norm error is I think with a T-Hono we could go down to 10, but with this one we can go even lower because actually our target is piecewise constant, so it helps. It's kind of better a priori information, this being piecewise constant, than the T-Hono that usually corresponds to some kind of smoothness. 
also for this other example, we had, uh, first of all, the minimum norm solution, again, uh, is not so good. This is Tihonov uh, without non-negativity constraint, and then this is Tihonov with non-negativity constraint. And then, actually, with total variation, <laughs> we get an extremely good reconstruction, but you know, this phantom only has jumps along vertical and horizontal lines. So this is kind of perfectly matched uh, a priori information, so that's kind of uh, almost cheating. <laughs> oh yeah, I know, that, that's, but we could also take a look how does this, <laughs> how does it look for the, uh, for the tomography case? So here I chose a regularization parameter one. Here you can see MATLAB's quad prog is outputting some whatever internal information it is giving us. And so here we have a total variation regularized solution. I think our regularization parameter is not optimal. Maybe we could make it a little bit larger because the reconstruction is so noisy. So let's actually put here, I don't know, 10 maybe? And let's recompute. Here, I, I think there are, there are uh, so the question was, is there some method or some rule of thumb for choosing the regularization parameter? Uh, here, I'm just doing it by <laughs> looking at the reconstructions. Uh, but also here, I have the luxury of, of having the original phantom right next here. Uh, in practical tomography, we don't have that because it's unknown. There are several methods for choosing the parameter Actually, one of them uh, we published recently is based on using these different uh, resolutions. So computing the total variation reconstruction at different resolutions from the same data, and then seeing uh, whether the, t the total variation norm of these reconstructions uh, is independent of the resolution. And it turns out, at least I would say tentatively, I would say that it seems that this kind of checking for resolution independence works as a method of choosing the parameter. But, well... Actually, it's a method for computating the Yeah, you could, yeah, you could, you could think so. So if, if it's not stable, then you put it bigger and... Where do you get satisfied with the joints? In that approach, so how we do it is, it seems to happen so that there is a kind of a phase transition of a kind that uh, for there seems to be a suitable uh, value for the parameter that for that value and for larger values, the total variation norm of the reconstructions stays constant regardless of the resolution. But if you use a smaller number uh, for the regularization parameter than that phase transition value, then uh, the norms are not stable. So it seems to give a method for finding the best kind of the the smallest parameter value that still gives stable TV norms. Yeah, it's, we also proved a theorem that says that uh, the norms are stable with any parameter, which is not in complete agreement what we see experimentally. I mean, the, the whole thing why the method seems to work is that <laughs> there seems to be, well, yeah, maybe more work is needed still to see what's really going on. But okay, so here we have this total variation and, and if we put a larger value, let's say 200, we should see something more flat. I mean, then the regularization part is dominating the process and uh, taking the reconstruction closer to constant. And it seems to be doing that in a bit weird way, maybe. It lost one of the squares <laughs> altogether, and it's strangely merging together the rest.
Okay. So maybe to summarize the idea, of course, this is very much uh, connected to what, what Bernd is telling in, in his course. So what needs to be done for an inverse problem is to provide a regularization strategy. So this is kind of a very general view of any inverse problem. We have some space, model space, where our unknown lives, and maybe we have some kind of domain of the forward map containing kind of uh, acceptable or, or good, good um, objects we are measuring. Then uh, in the data space, we have the range of the forward map, which especially for nonlinear inverse problems can be very complicated and maybe not even characterized. But anyway, the situation is that we have, uh, we have the ideal F and we have the ideal data AF, and then the actual data is something else, and maybe it's not even on the range of the forward map. And then what needs to be done is to construct a family of operators, linear or nonlinear operators, gamma alpha, that are defined on the whole of the data space. And when they are applied to the noisy data, they should, the result here should uh, appro uh, approach the ideal F along a stable path, asymptotically when delta, the noise level, which we assume to be known, when delta goes to zero, then this uh, regularized reconstruction should approach F. And also we should specify a method for choosing the parameter alpha as a function of the noise level delta. That's somehow the official method of solving ill-posed inverse problems. And now, uh, so far we saw uh, a few examples here, how, to, how that can be done. Uh, so we had the classical Tihonov, which has the two norm of F. We had the classical Tihonov with non-negativity constraint. And then we also had the total variation. Well, we, we used the anisotropic form of it, but basically it's the one norm of the gradient here. And also we use the non-negativity constraint. And I think the techniques discussed by Professor Hoffman in his course are, are useful for proving that this kind of strategies uh, fulfill the necessary conditions to, to give a, a reliable regularized inversion method. Later in this course, I will also talk about a couple of, couple of extra things. Maybe, uh, well, looking at situations, first of all, when, when this is not a one norm of F, but, but actually a base of space norm that can be written in terms of wavelets. And then it actually becomes a question of sparsity in wavelet spaces, wavelet basis, to look for uh, the reconstruction in the form that it's written with as few wavelets as possible, or shearlets. Of course, it can be any other basis or frame uh, in that kind of approach. So we have some set of building blocks. They could even be learned by dictionary learning or machine learning, and then re reconstruct in a way that tries to write the unknown in terms of as few building blocks as possible. And let's see, still have some like nine minutes to go. Okay, so let me, let me actually go to the real world example and let's take a look at the back projection later. So one, one of the uh, things we're dealing with, so I think Maybe one of the take-home take, uh, take messages in my course is that um, when, when dealing with applied inverse problems, when the starting point is that some end user somewhere has a need, uh, some problem that can be solved with inverse uh, problems methods, then it's important also to judge how well was the solution done, how good is, is the solution we offer, then that should be judged by the end user. How well is the problem there solved? And this is one example where, where uh, we try to do that. So this is, oh no, this is, uh, should I? Okay, actually, I think, I forgot I have this walnut. Let's do this walnut thing and the, the hospital example 
on Thursday. So on top of those simulated examples I showed, let me show you a couple of now other uh, approaches. So this is actually one of the X one, a more serious X-ray lab in the University of Helsinki Physics Department. Here is one of the groups we made some measurements uh, of a walnut. So we put a walnut there in the radiation field, rotated it. Uh, actually, this data, if you want to play with it, uh, it's openly available on the Finnish Inverse Problem so Society page. We also provide some matrices so you can, and, and some MATLAB code so you can very easily start experimenting. So we actually collected 1,200 images like this. So we took very small angular steps so that when we used all of them, 1,200 uh, projections with filtered back projection, we get this extremely detailed uh, slice through the walnut. But then, because you know this course is about sparse data tomography, if we only take 20 projections and feed it to the filtered back projection, we get something like this. We can still make out maybe the basic outlines of the walnut there, but I mean the image quality is not as good as with all of the data. So we could try these other regularization methods uh, to these 20 projections only. So let's see, so this is uh, the positivity constraint or non-negativity constraint Tihonov. So for the real data case, it looks like this. Uh, here is the total variation regularization, again with the non-negativity constraint. Mm, this is the so-called total generalized variation developed by Professor Christian Bredis and his collaborators. Christian was kind enough uh, to let me borrow his code and compute these reconstructions, so thanks to him. So total generalized variation aims not for piecewise constant reconstructions, but for piecewise smooth reconstructions. Then uh, I mentioned this sparsity in a basis. So let's say the first uh, inverse problems paper about, about uh, or let's say a fundamental paper about this approach is this uh, by Dobeshi, De Vries and De Mol, where they showed this kind of soft thresholding iteration approach and proved that it converges uh, for, for ill post inverse problems. So here we do something quite simple. We, we have an iteration, so Fn comes from the previous iterate Fn minus one with this kind of uh, gradient step. First of all, uh, A transpose I will explain in more detail uh, on, on Thursday. And then there is this special operator S mu, which is a s uh, soft thresholding operator. S mu looks like this. Uh, if we have the input wavelet coefficients and output wavelet coefficients, this function would do nothing. Then we could have also hard thresholding that puts puts anything smaller than mu over two to zero. But then there's also soft thresholding, which actually goes from here. So then it's a continuous function actually doing the thresholding, and that's uh, this S mu used here. So what it's doing here, it, it's taking a wavelet expansion of the argument function or vector and soft thresholds the wavelet coefficients. So wavelets uh, look like this. As you might know, they have several scales and uh, horizontal, vertical, diagonal details at each scale. And then a, a low pass part uh, in the corner. And then actually uh, we can use a bias of space regularization here with hard wavelets. And I think here with the Dobeshi 2 wavelets. So this is also another possibility. This is computed with shearlets. And now I think uh, it's, it's good to finish here to give you the idea that from exactly the same data, we get all of these reconstructions. From exactly the same x-ray data, which is very sparse. So you see the, 
the part played by the regularization is very big because the data alone is not specifying the unknown very precisely. And I think it's a general idea in solving inverse problems that the measurement data is not enough, it's unstable and missing. We have to put in a priori information, some other knowledge about the unknown. And that's done in the form of regularization. And here you can really see that the effect of regularization is really, really big uh, in, in sparse tomography. Okay, so I think I'll stop here for today and let's continue uh, on Thursday. Okay, any questions or remarks? If this is not the case, let's thank Professor Samuli again. Thank you. Thank you.